So what I'm going to um, talk about is broadband access abstraction. So this is um, uh, an industry initiative to really sort of take forward a lot of the things that, um, in fact, a lot of things that I've heard th this week. Um, I think there's been a there's been a theme of talking about um, interoperability, um, migration, and coexistence. You know, so what do we sort of do about bringing about you know, all of these new capabilities that we sort of talk about, how do we do that in an environment where you have, um, you know, a lot of, you know, what a lot of people term as being legacy. Now, let me, let me sort of reject a little bit this idea of, of legacy, because when people sort of say that, they're really talking about um, a billion subscribers on residential broadband um, who average about um, $80 ARPU monthly. You know, if that's legacy, then, you know, that's a pretty massive, you know, legacy, not something you really want to kind of cannibalize, you know, um, in any kind, of, uh, any kind of way. So that's really the approach that we have taken with bringing um, virtualization and, and a lot of the, the promise of virtualization into broadband networks is how do you do this in a way which is, you know, not going to be, um, oh, maybe I'm going the wrong way here. Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, maybe it'll work in a second. <laughs> Doing it the right way around might help. <laughs> okay, so um, um, so these are the sort of topics I'm going to sort of cover. So, um, what exactly this evolution is sort of driving? What the challenge is? What BAA actually is um, looking at its relationship with Cloud Central Office, so what uh, the, the Huawei presentation was talking about, um, what's already come out, because this is different. This is, you know, we are a standards body, but we are learning how to be, um, how to be agile and, and much, much sort of faster, so being more kind of open source style. Um, what Open Broadband is, so this is an initiative that actually started um, last year, but uh, I'll say a bit more about that. So, so this is today's um, access. So this is, this is legacy. You know, this is, this is TR101. This is um, a technical report that we did going back quite some years. Um, but most networks, this is exactly what they're based on, on today. And if you ask most operational people about uh, virtualized services and the promise of virtualization, I would sort of say this, most of them I've spoken to completely freak out when you say that you're going to bring virtualization into this, into this environment. So they may not be worrying about those, you know, trillions of dollars in, in ARPU on current broadband networks, but what they do worry about is disruption to what they've, what they've been deploying. Um, you know, they, they, they live and breathe five nines um, capabilities. So that's their kind of reaction to this, is, is what they want to see is, is migration um, and coexistence while we have these two um, functions going on at the same time, having both virtual and, and the physical um, functions. Um, and, they, and they want to be able to sort of see, you know, to be able to achieve that, what you really need is, is interoperability. So that's where those three uh, words come in. So the, these new technologies are certainly um, create some dangers um, for the stability of this network, but there is a way through, and that's obviously what we've been, what we've been working on. So th this, this on the right-hand side, this is the um, kind of the basic di diagram for the Cloud Central Office. So the way we, we really put the Cloud Central Office idea together is to say, you know, we don't, we, we kind of conceive this from the point of view of regardless of whether the boxes of functionality, so those, those big boxes in there, whether, whether, that are, whether they are white boxes, gray boxes, black boxes, we don't really care. What we designed was, was something with, with open interfaces and a flexible uh, framework where you could plug in what you wanted to be able to sort of do. So if you want to go ahead and have, you know, maybe a pod of cord in certain parts of this network, then you could. But if you wanted to 
plugins of you know VNFs from from Huawei or Nokia or, or any of the other um, vendors, then you could do you know the same thing. And BAA is the specific sort of piece of this which which um, manages. So let me go a little bit more into into this. So so this is the sort of you know the obviously the three hundred pound gorilla, which is actually an elephant. Um, so this is this is sort of the challenge that faces us. Um, so it, it is a technical challenge, but it's also um, a very big um, business challenge. So some sort of preamble, you know, obviously, you know, you've got this sort of this business environment that, uh, it, it, that you want to be able to negotiate. You don't, you don't want to cannibalize anything. So to be able to achieve this, uh, you want this seamless migration. You do want long-term coexistence because we're not assuming that this coexistence is going to go away anytime soon. Now, I, I know some operators are much more aggressive on this, you know, and I, I don't need to mention sort of who. I mean, everyone, everyone knows that there are some operators that are much more aggressive. They're talking about more kind of forklift changes. They're talking more in terms of this being a greenfield kind of environment. So maybe they segment the network and they sort of say, these things we're going to do in a greenfield fashion. So therefore, we're going to do this forklift change for... Um, virtualized um, services um, but we think and this is what we hear from from operators we speak to and ones that are active in the forum is that the vast majority aren't going to do it that way the vast majority do worry about long-term coexistence um, but they want an agile architecture so that um, they can bring new functionality either in the form of, of white box solutions or potentially in fact putting um, new functions on top of old boxes, which is something that maybe hasn't been talked about that much, but that's really what a coexistence would look like because, of course, what you don't want to be able to do as an operator is just roll out services across maybe some of your customer base. You want, you want that capability on as many customers as possible um, so that obviously you can drive you know, more revenue. So what is um, OBBEA? So it's Open Broadband broadband access abstraction. So open broadband is the wider initiative, so we are generally driving in this direction of bringing agility and, and open source or style with, with open standards. And BAA is the specific um, project. So um, it, it delivers um, source code and documents. So what we mean by the, by the documents, and this is kind of a little bit of a throwaway line, but I don't mean it you know, that way. We're not just doing code. So you'll hear in some open source projects that, you know, they're churning code out and, and that's kind of the main aim of everything that's happening is just more and more code. What we worry about is productizing these solutions. So when we talk about documentation, we're talking about um, the, the framework, we're talking about, um, you know, use cases, we're talking about those kind of, you know, those kind of documents that you would expect to come from a, a network vendor. So these are things that are, are ready to actually be deployed. So deployment is our big um, concern. Um, that it, it, um, so it's obviously standardized. Um, it's automated deployment of those cloud-based uh, services. Um, and it's, it, it's the idea that you can kind of put, you can plug together those physical network functions and those, those virtual functions. So as I say, this is kind of the idea of of uh, coexistence. So it's, it's reducing risk. Uh, that's obviously one, one thing that we're sort of trying to sort of do here. As I said, the, you know, you talk to an operational person, certainly if you talk to the, to the business guys who are worrying about those, uh, introducing those new services, that's really the kind of the key to them. And it's interesting that there's been a number of presentations over the last few days that talk about um, having cost models about having kind of proven business models. And what you're sort of trying to do is always kind of prove this sort of fact before you get to deployment. And we think, you know, absolutely. I mean, absolutely, you need to have these very solid uh, cost models. But really, kind of sort of beyond that, you want sort of something which is, you know, not going to disrupt those current, you know, revenue streams, that you want to be able to deploy those new services in a way which is, which is, which is, transparent but not going to uh, affect those underlying uh, services. So the, the service providers you know, can introduce this new um, infrastructure, uh, they can migrate, um, they have increased choice. 
um, because we're seeing this as being, um, you know, there, there are challenges. If you go down the, the path of, of white box solutions, then, um, you know, potentially you could cause yourself some issues in terms of, of how you're innovating for, for new services. Um, you know, you look tr traditionally in the broadband space, where most of the innovation has really come from is the, the vendor community. That's, that's you know, they, they listen to requirements. You know, this, this kind of goes a little bit back in history at the Broadband Forum. You know, traditionally how we worked was that the operators would give their requirements. You know, the vendors would listen to those requirements and they would develop solutions in the meetings. That, that, you know, and not everything, of course, because they had plenty of bells and whistles that they would add on top of a standardised um, architecture. But generally speaking, that's how they would, um, you know, operate. So the innovation would, would come from, from the vendors. One thing that sort of seems a bit of a sort of concern, you know, moving forward is you don't want to strangle that innovation. You still want to be able to see those bells and whistles being developed. So you need an architecture, you need a way of developing this that would, that would not affect that, uh, that innovation. So you really want to kind of marry these two things together, um, you know, open source and, and the open standards. So from the equipment manufacturer sort of like point of view, you know, what's the be real benefit they get here? Well, you could sort of say that it's really a step forward from what they've always done with open standards because that's always been, you know, the plumbing has always been an expensive proposition and not necessarily where, where the, you know, the money is from a vendor sort of perspective. So the idea of doing the plumbing in an even more effective way, in an even more collaboratory way, you know, open source is, is that answer. You could, you could almost argue, and in fact, I, I'm going to sort of say it, I am going to argue this. I think that a lot of the work in open source is really the logical conclusion of open standards. That's the way we've kind of always worked. It's just that we haven't actually done the coding um, together. It's been done kind of individually. But really, this is a logical step to go to this sort of path. But doing it with open standards creates a certain sort of discipline and, um, and a larger consensus and therefore a, a larger market for these new solutions. So on the, on the left we have the uh, access abstraction, again on the right the, the uh, Cloud Central Office. Um, you can see how it kind of sort of fits in, um, how we um, have developed the various sort of, you know, interfaces. You know, how a lot of this started with the BAA layout was for some time we've actually been developing Yang models for, uh, for management um, in, in access. So this was probably the logical step in between doing interface documents and doing the agile development of BAA. We'd already st started to, to develop these Yang models. So we have uh, Yang management models for, um, for, for even for some of the old DSL technologies because obviously it's just still people are still deploying it today. Um, we certainly have it for GFAST, for, for, for GPON, for XGSPON, um, for various other um, management interfaces that were, that were needed. So um, we've basically reused those YAM models um, into, into BAA. So, um, as I said, you know, so, so it's based a lot of these, uh, these YAM models, both southbound and, and northbound. Um, it uh, allows those access nodes, and this is kind of the, the point I was making earlier, that you're using um, current access nodes and you're building additional functionality um, over the, the top of those, some of them. I'm not going to sort of say you can do this all the time, because of course you, you can't, but for, for some. Um, that it's um, about this sort of the, the, the kind of uh, management of access nodes that you would expect, you know, how you discover them and, and manage them. Um, we have the, these usage instructions, so this is the documentation I was sort of talking about. Um, so what we've released already, so this happened in, in July, the first release of uh, BAA. Um, with release documentation, with a, um, uh, with a white paper that kind of explains the sort of like the process we used and what we're, we're aiming at. So it's basically a full kind of what you could argue as a product release. So some people don't like me sort of saying it exactly that way because we're not exactly producing product. Um, you know, this is a refer reference implementation and the products obviously come from the, uh, you know, from the vendor community. But I kind of think of this as being kind of products because I think that's the difference in a sense between 
what we have traditionally done in the standard space and what we need to do going forward. You know, we need to sort of think of this um, as not just, you know, you're not just producing a piece of paper and, you know, people can download the PDF. You know, it's, it's, it's an actual thing. You know, you're, you're actually producing code. Okay, so th this fits into a wider kind of pattern of activity uh, for us. So open broadband does kind of cover um, more places, and there's a few things I should sort of mention. So um, USP TR69, so this is kind of our uh, device management and service management uh, protocol. USP is the latest version. Um, it's been, been adapted from TR69. It's more granular. Um, it's more adapted to, the, um, to IoT and smart home um, and to virtualization. Um, we also have an open broadband uh, Wi-Fi project. So this is uh, based off of the, um, the new mesh protocols from, uh, from the Wi-Fi Alliance. We, we have a project with the Purple Foundation to develop uh, carrier class Wi-Fi um, uh, enablement. So uh, there's uh, development of management models. There's, you know, there's development of a reference imp implementation. Again, the idea is, is to be able to um, accelerate uh, development. On the access space, you know, uh, we're, we're doing much what we've always sort of done, open certifications, um, open testing sort of protocols. For 5G and cloud, now so the 5G activity, we, we have uh, an ongoing fixed mobile convergence project with 3GPP that will be plugged into cloud CO. We, we're not there yet. Um, this is taking some effort. It's not the most straightforward thing in the world doing fixed mobile convergence. There's a lot of, of negotiating between the two networks that needs to happen, you know, e even in terms of language and methodology. Um, but we're, we're going through that with the aim of plugging it into the Cloud Central Office uh, concept. So we've already delivered the first um, release also of the Cloud Central Office. What we're now doing is we're developing application notes. The idea of the application note is really a use case. And that use case will turn into a, a test specification that then will be used at the Open Broadband Labs. So we have, at the moment, we have one lab in, in Beijing that's already been doing application note testing. Um, we are going to open um, others as well. Um, and, and again, this is the, the idea of going beyond the traditional standard space. So we're going not just to developing code, but to testing that code in a more kind of DevOps um, environment. So I, I think you can sort of, you know, hopefully you can sort of see from this, this is a, an evolution of the work of the Broadband Forum. You know, we, we are very proud of our, of our history. You know, having those billion subscribers, you know, that is largely the responsibility, I would sort of say, of, of the Broadband Forum, along with people like Cable Labs, obviously on the cable side, um, and the ITU and Etsy and some other um, organizations that developed the protocols but we were the ones that really drove the testing um, and management that made this into a mass market and I suppose what we're keenly aware of now is to you know we agree that the, the potential in virtualization and the uses of, of SDN um, are great but we do want to do this in such a way that you can real, realize that potential without you know adversely affecting what we already have that billion subscribers um, and hopefully, you know, we'll get to, you know, somebody asked me the other day, will we get to two billion? Because two billion would basically be every house in the world. Because that's really what the, the billion at the moment is like half the population. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether we'll ever, ever, ever exactly get to that sort of point. You know, you wonder about fixed wireless access and what 5G is going to sort of do. Um, but the one thing I think you can sort of say is the fixed network plays that central role because it will play a central role in 5G and in fixed wireless access. So um, it's going to be a very interesting sort of time. So I think that's more or less it. Cause, um, so just a sort of summary of what I said. I should mention particularly the participating companies. It's not actually a full list, actually. There's, um, there's actually a couple more I've just added who have just signed off on their, their uh, forms. Um, but Broadcom, BT, Calix, CenturyLink, China Telecom, Huawei, Nokia, Telecom Italia, Tibet, UNH, and ZTE. So you can sort of see, I mean, there's a, there's a good mix uh, between uh, operators and vendors um, driving this and uh, very actively involved. We have, a, we have a good number of coders that are actively um, writing this code. 
So there it is. So thank you very much. I don't suppose we have time for questions. Or